Most people I know who use AI fall into one of two traps. They use it once, get a bad result, and decide unequivocally that AI is all hype. Or they think it will magically replace all jobs, use it to do absolutely everything and never check what it produces. Truth is, as it stands now, AI is a tool and it's only as good as the person using it. For construction professionals, AI can help with faster estimating, writing scopes of works, and reviewing contracts. It can save you, if you know how to use it properly, hours and hours of work. So in this video, we're gonna show you how to use these large language models to do valuable work. We'll cover how these models actually work so you understand their uses and limitations, and also how to prompt them effectively. And we'll finish off with some examples. What we're not gonna be covering in this video is tools that embed AI, like Procore or Autodesk, but also we're not gonna cover how to set up AI agents and automation. This is all gonna be done completely through the web interface of large language models like ChatGVT, Claude, and Google Gemini. Let's start off by talking about how these large language models work. A large language model is a mathematical model trained on billions of words books, websites, documents, the whole internet. They're like more or less an advanced autocomplete. They're trained to predict the next word or as they use them, token in a series of letters. So what can they do? They can produce content, like they can draft letters, contracts, work breakdown structures and schedules. They can summarize documents. You can upload a document into them and they can produce a concise summary. They can prepare explanations of complicated technical processes, and they can help you to rewrite scopes or schedules. They're capable of generalizing patterns to new problems, simulating step-by-step -step logic, and handling unfamiliar requests. Importantly, they don't think or know, they just guess incredibly well. So the interface of one of these chat models looks a little bit like this. Now, this is Claude, which is by far my favorite model, where you type into there, which is called prompting the model, and you'll get a text-based response. Some of the models like ChatGVT also produce images if you request them. So how do these models work? Well, they get trained on huge amounts of data. So a whole lot of data gets uploaded into these training models. The model is then a giant mathematical function that's produced from the training data where they review all the patterns in the language they create this giant mathematical model that captures all the patterns in the model. Then the model is effectively a prediction engine. They generate one word or token at a time based on the context they're given. They don't actually fundamentally know or understand, they've just identified all the patterns in the training data they're given. They also have a context window, which means they have their training data the mathematical model, and then within the prompt you give them, you give them context around the task you want them to complete. And unless they're integrated into other tools, they don't have access to the they don't have access to the internet or other tools like your calendar or Excel documents. Okay, so which large language model should you use? Well, there's a ton of different models out there, and there's lots of different ways to evaluate which ones you should use. Some are very expensive to use, some are cheap to use. Some you can upload huge documents into, some you can only upload small documents to them. Three main ones that I use are ChatGVT, Claude, Opus, and Gemini Pro. So ChatGVT I find best for general use. It's got strong reasoning, it's fast, and but it has a relatively small context window. So 128,000 context is something like I think about 300 pages of text. Claude Opus is a reasoning model, which means it's a bit slower, but it's better at handling long documents and reasoning with complex tasks. It has a slightly larger context window. And then Gemini is probably the worst model in terms of its ability to reason and process information, but you can upload, you can upload huge documents into it. So the way I would choose which model to use, if it's just general questions or information, almost always use ChatGPT. It's a very complicated task where I'm not 100% sure how to do it. I want the model to reason and think through it practically. So I want to set up some new Excel spreadsheet for estimating and I have no idea how to do it. I'll use something like Claude Opus. I use Gemini. If I've got a huge document, I want it to summarize because Gemini is probably the weakest model, but the best at uploading huge documents too. Okay, so what are some of the limitations of these models? Well, the first one is they hallucinate. Because they're not deterministic, 
they're probabilistic. If you give them the same prompt, you'll get different answers. Some of these answers end up being hallucinations where they're just completely incorrect. And for example, I've actually had this where I was at work and I was trying to look up an Australian standard for emergency lighting within a switch room. ChatGPT actually invented a fake standard and referenced information from another standard that wasn't relevant to my project, which made me look a bit silly. They also, when they do these hallucinations, they'll obviously, they, they give them to you with incredible sounding confidence. They have no judgment. So again, they're just prediction engines. They don't fundamentally understand what happens. So they might incorrectly they might incorrectly judge how important something is or remove a key clause. They don't really understand what you're trying to achieve. They just give, based on the prompt and the context you give them, they're always giving you the most likely response. They oversummarize, they can lose context. You have to be aware of the context window that if you've got some huge context window, you're uploading lots of documents, the chat can forget what's happening halfway through it. They can be inconsistent with formatting and they can be because they're working on these mathematical predictions or they are getting much better at maths, they're often not very good at mathematical stuff that we would think is quite simple. Okay, the final point I wanna make about using these large language models is privacy and data. When you upload information into a large language model, you're sending your data to an external company. So if it's important contractual data, you shouldn't be uploading it to a large language model unless you have a custom made one for your organization where you're using a private large language model. So don't upload full contracts, names of people, private information, because the data can be used for training new models if you're using them on a free plan. Next, let's talk about prompting. How do you instruct a large language model to do something so you get the best possible response? So this might sound a little weird, but the why I think about AI, it's like having access to Albert Einstein, but he's locked in your basement. He can't see your job, your project, what you're trying to do. You own, he can only see bits of paper that you pass through to him. If you're vague, unclear, not specific, you'll get generic answers. You have to tell him everything he needs to know to be able to solve the problem you're asking him to. How do we prompt him effectively? How do we give Albert the information he needs to know to solve our problem? Well. Simple prompting formula you should use is you are a role, your task is to do X, Y, Z. Using this background context, return it in this specific format. For example, you're a contracts manager, review the attached subcontract and return a list of risks in a table. You're giving it a role, who you want it to be, a task to review the attached subcontract and returning a list of risks in a table, the format you want the answer. So every prompt should have a role, who you want the AI to be, task, who, what you want the AI to do, context, what background information it needs to complete the task, and the format you want the output in. Now, the mistake I see people make when they prompt is that they blindly accept the output. To get the most out of AI, you actually need to know what you're doing. You need good judgment to be able to assess the response and re-prompt it. Most people prompt something once, they get a bad output and they decide the AI isn't good at whatever task you've set it. The reality is most prompts that I would do, I would do three to five revisions of it to get the best possible answer. I'll tell it what's wrong with it, I'll tell it how to improve it. You should. Prompt it, but then you should also be willing to go through multiple revisions to get the best possible answer from it. The worst thing you can do is just blindly accept the output, for example, some sort of report or project management plan that you just blindly send to your client without edits. So what are some traps to avoid with prompting is to blindly trust the output, you'll miss nuisance, nuance, you'll miss important tasks. To give it vague prompts, you'll get generic results. To give it too much fluff, you'll confuse it and not pay attention to the important context. And so in addition to needing good judgment to get the most out of these models and actually understanding the task you want it to achieve, there are some important traps you should avoid when using them. First one is blindly trusting them. They hallucinate, they make mistakes, they can also miss nuance. Maybe you haven't prompted it effectively, maybe you haven't given it the right context. Don't give them vague prompts or you'll get generic results. You give it too much fluff, you can confuse the model, use up your context window, and it'll miss important tasks. Also to remember that these models have this issue where they can become a bit sycophantic and always tell you you're correct 
always tell you that, always agree with you and tell you you're correct. Sometimes adding to a prompt something like be hypercritical, be hypercritical of my plan, I find to be incredibly effective. Some prompting techniques that will massively improve your output is that to show, don't tell, give examples of the type of output you want where possible, break down tasks as much as possible. More specific prompts will always get better results than massive prompts where you're asking the model to do five things at once. Use constraints, ask it to do something in a short amount of text, long, the structure you want it to be in, the tone. So for example, the hypercritical tone I find very useful. Use act as, that'll help give the model more context of what you're trying to achieve. Format your instructions and give it as much context, but not fluff, relevant to your task as possible. Let's wrap up by going through some example prompts of putting these best practices into action and seeing how as construction contractors, we can take full advantage of the power of large language models. So the examples I'm gonna show you are gonna be in Claude, one of the large language models. Claude is my favorite one. I find it much better at reasoning and complex tasks than ChatGPT. To start with, I'm gonna open a new chat and these large language models remember context within a chat. So if you start a new chat, Claude will remember everything that happens in that chat. So if you're working on a new project, a new task, I would always open a new chat. First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it context about our project and upload the key documents. So I told it I'm working on a project to complete HV terminations on a solar farm attached to the project documents. I'm providing this as context only and I'm gonna get you to help me with a series of construction management tasks. Do you understand? So I've uploaded the, ten, the technical specifications and the scope of works. So Claude has said that it's understood. It's noted the documents have uploaded and done an assessment of them. So the first thing I'm gonna ask it to do is can you create a work breakdown structure for this project to help me understand the scope? And it's gone ahead and done that. I really like Claude as well because it generates documents. It doesn't, it's not just all in the chat window, but it's actually got documents you can give it feedback to and iterate on. So the first thing it's done, it's created a work breakdown structure for our project. We've broken down into project management, mobilization and start setup, procurement and materials. It's got all the listed out, all the materials we need, the installation works and blah, blah, blah. The next task I'm gonna ask Claude to help us with is to prepare an estimate for the project. So I've simply prompted it, can you prepare an estimate for the project? And I've asked it to clearly show the working so we can check it. Again, it's gone ahead and done this. It's prepared a e cost estimate for our construction project. It's broken it down into labor materials, plant and equipment, subcontractors, preliminaries. And under each one, it's given quite a comprehensive breakdown. So we can go through and assess this again. Breakdown's important because we can then give it feedback and iterate. I'm not gonna iterate through multiple revisions of the prompt now, but I'm just more or less showing you the capabilities of what these tools can do. So it's got a breakdown of how it's come up with the labor cost, what labor rates it's used, what crew composition it has, then the labor hours and how it's calculated that. It's got two hours per termination for, to prepare the cables, six hours to install the termination, an hour to test, so nine hours per termination, 216 hours at the crew rate of 517 is how it's come up with the labor amount. Basically, you can go through and check this, you can give it feedback. You can always assess whether it's missed anything, whether the material costs look reasonable, and basically, here's a breakdown of the estimate for you to review. The next thing I've asked Claude to do is for a copy of the subcontract we've been given, I've asked, attached as a subcontract agreement, our client has provided us, can you please review this and generate a list of clauses we should depart from? So it's given me a recommended departure schedule. It's listed out any of the clauses that have risk associated with them and whether we should, what we should depart back and negotiate with them. For example, critical departures required, Clause three, subcontract sum, fixed lump sum unless, whoop, fixed lump sum unless otherwise agreed in writing. Issues, no provision for rise and fall if the materials have a long lead time, no allowances for client cause delays, no provisional sums for undefined GIS interfaces. And it's actually given some incredibly good recommendations. It's gone and done this for liquidated damages, payment terms, defects liability period, and all the key clauses. The next thing that I asked Claude to do, and this actually shocked me how 
impressively it did this and how impressive the result was. But all I asked it to do is, can you now create a project schedule for this project, including a Gantt chart? And it went ahead and created this, basically a fully interactive Gantt chart with clickable, clickable buttons. You can export the schedule, but it took the work breakdown structure, it's understanding the project scope, and it created a full Gantt chart broken down into mobilization, the terminations, the indoor terminations, testing, commissioning. It's actually got a drop down menu. So I didn't prompt any of this. It did this all on its own, where I can look at just the mobilization phase, just the indoor termination phase, just the handover phase. It's also identified the critical path. So simply with a click of a button, I can change from milestone view to critical path view. It's highlighted all the key bits of information, such as the critical path, the eight week pro project duration, and everything just off the single prompt. <laughs> can you create a project schedule? And again, we could give it feedback. We could ask it to include resourcing, to factor in public holidays, anything we can think of, we could ask it to make improvements. But I was really shocked at how, what, what it created with just that single prompt. The next thing I asked it after it created the schedule was ask Claude, based on the schedule, do we need to change the estimate to the schedule and the estimate align? Now, this is a useful check to do whenever you're estimating that if you've, for example, got an eight week program with five full time employees, does this actually align with the labor estimate you've come up with? Claude has done this assessment based on that prompt. It's determined that the labor hours were estimated by 100 hours based on the schedule hours versus the estimate hours. There's a cash flow crisis at week seven. Again, I didn't prompt it to check cash flow. I've just simply prompted it based on this updated schedule. Are there any changes to the estimate? And again, it's given us a full report of this sort of investigation. Again, if you tailor the prompts, if you're more specific with exactly what you're looking at, you'll always get better results. And the final use I've got for our project is we've done the schedule, we've done the estimate, we've reviewed the contract. Say we're starting work, so we need to generate an inspection and test plan. Simply prompted it, generate an inspection and test plan for this project. And here we go, it's gone and created an ITP. Now we'd obviously have to check and review this, make sure we've given it enough context, make sure it aligns with what we're looking for. But in literally seconds, we've created some very useful construction documents that probably in the past would have taken us a day or two to generate. Those were just a couple of very simple and straightforward use cases, but you can see the incredible power of these tools for construction managers. It really comes down to our creativity and our willingness to use them. Again, you have to remember that these models can hallucinate, they can make mistakes, so you always need to check what they're actually producing. You can get a little bit caught up or drawn in by how impressive the displays are, how quickly they do it, but there is a very serious chance that these models make mistakes, so you do need to check what they're producing.